Hello, everybody. This is Symmetry Live. Woo, 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 woo. Woo, woo. I feel like it's January and it's kind of drab outside, so I have to like do something exciting. <laughs> and for two of us, this is called Providers in Pajamas. Oh. <laughs> So glad to be with you. I'm very supportive of providers of pajamas, but <laughs> hello, everybody. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know us, we are part of the Symmetry Solutions team. We usually try on most Fridays to have a, a little Symmetry Live and talk about a topic that might be of interest or that we know people have questions about. And today with me, I've got the wonderful Janice Spangler, who is coming to us from the Salt Lake City area. Lindsay Hyde, who is coming to us from the Colorado area. Denver? Denver-ish? Denver. Denver yes. Yes. Okay. And Sarah Hughes-Zabawa, who's coming to us from the Montana area. So we have uh, here at Symmetry, we have a lot of different providers who offer both coaching and therapeutic services, depending on your needs and your location. And uh, we're super excited to be with you today. So feel free to ask us questions on the threads and we'll try to pay attention to those or give us comments as well. And today the topic is, we're gonna quickly talk a little bit about uh, faith transitions. So that's something that our uh, group practice kind of specializes in, people who are either questioning their religion or religious background or faith community or um, faith tradition or, um, or leaving their faith tradition. Uh, we also work a lot with people who are in relationships with both, right? So like if you're in a marriage where one of you is questioning or leaving and one of you is not, that can obviously bring about some unique challenges. Um, and so today I'm gonna turn it right over to you, Sarah, cause you're the one that came up with the quote. So what was the quote that inspired us to wanna to talk about this today? <laughs> Oh no, Lindsay, you might have to read it. Sometimes I say things and I don't even remember that they were quote worthy. To, I'll be happy to quote Sarah. She said, what hurts us doesn't hurt everyone and what heals us doesn't heal everyone. Thanks, Lindsay. Where this comes from, where that statement comes from is so oftentimes when we're working with clients in faith transition, what has ushered them into a faith crisis or faith expansion is so uniquely different. And what allows healing and growth looks really different. And yet sometimes when we see someone in deep pain, we want them to have the solutions that worked for us, right? And what we often see with individuals who are identify as apologetic, what they wanna do is offer suggestions of how you can make this work. Sometimes that really works for other people. Sometimes deconstruction, breaking it all down from a historical perspective creates an amazing amount of like clarity, peace, but the reality is what works for us might not work for someone else. And that needs to be honored, right? And so there needs to be permission in those who are having a faith expansion, one, to have those around them be humble, soft, and really just like, what do you need to be well? But also the permission that our journeys are so uniquely different. And sometimes there's a lot of growth in witnessing someone else's relief or how they've reconciled, you know, their spiritual journey. And yet at the same time, we have to have radical permission that we get to choose what our healing looks like. We get to choose what allows us to be well. And it can look very different or very similar to those who've gone before us. I think this is just so important because I think it's just a pretty normal human occurrence that, you know, if I'm a human and you're a human, well, you must be having the same experience I'm having. Right? You, you must think about this like I do. And, uh, and, and, and especially I think when it comes to religious themes, uh, it can be very, difficult to um, make space for somebody else's perspective, right? Especially when it's kind of like the religious perspective. And so I think, uh, for example, when I work with a lot of people, I hear sometimes, well, I, I grew up in the church or I grew up, you know, believing these things and it was really helpful to me. Um, so I don't really get why you're saying that you were damaged or hurt by it, right? And so again, that's kind of an example of, well, if it was good for me, then I can't really believe you that it was not good for you. Does that, does that resonate? 
I think, they, would, yeah, Lindsay. Oh, I was just going to say, I think one of the main keys is just the um, art of active listening and to really um, be willing to be open enough to hear that someone else's experience might actually be different than yours. And the, you know, just like you were saying, although some people have a really wonderful experience with one aspect of their life, be it religion or whatever, that, that really does not mean that everyone else has that same experience, but it takes a lot of, I don't know, I guess, um, belief in, in yourself to be willing to be open to listen to the fact that someone else's experience is so different. So having the confidence in yourself that it's not going to affect your own beliefs, but also having the space for someone else, because you're never going to be able to help someone if you're imposing your, your, your solution on them, which is a solution to your problem, not to their problem. Mike Fuller is listening in and he says, I told a well-intended friend that their testimony was the last thing I needed to hear at the time. So that's mm -hmm. an example of a boundary. Um, and I know Jana, you were gonna say something, so. Well, I was just gonna say that we bless us, I think in our culture, our wider American culture and also our church culture can, um, we lend ourselves toward wanting to fix we like to fix, we like to have solutions. So when we see someone in some distress and it's something we've we've experienced and we know something about, I mean, I just wanna recognize our, that impulse that comes to us that we wanna fix it, right? Which can lead us into thinking we have the fix for another soul. And I just wanna name that a faith journey is um, sacred and it's individual and it is, um, it is led by, our innermost heart and and connection to the world and to meaning and to what is bigger than us and and so we can never fully fully know how another soul moves in that and so this need for listening empathy and I, I'm going to paraphrase a Brene quote about empathy where it it it's what we've been speaking to is that empathy is getting in a place where you believe another person's experience, not what you imagine their experience to be. And so that's the kind of stance that this takes. Um, and so sometimes we have to just uh, notice that impulse in us to fix. And I know for me, I have to sit and fight that, <laughs> thinking that I know I have the solution for other people and just make space for them to explore themselves and just to hear and listen to their experience. I love that, Janet. I think when we are soft enough, we recognize in our own suffering, I don't need someone to fix it. Mm -hmm. I just need someone to witness it. And so if this is something you'd like to explore or learn more about, a dear client recommend a new book that came out last year. It's called The Art of Holding Space, A Practice of Love, Liberation, and Leadership by Heather Platt. And I've loved kind of the permission giving it has of our love is in the witnessing and in this response to our witnessing. It is not in the fixing. And Jenna, what you said, like no one needs to fix someone else's soul. That is not either in their wheelhouse or their responsibility. It is in the partnering that healing happens. I, I have an amazing quote I just pulled up. This is from Parker Palmer. Um, it says, the human soul doesn't want to be advised or fixed or saved. It simply wants to be witnessed, to be seen, heard, and companioned exactly as it is. When we make that kind of deep bow to the soul of a suffering person, our respect reinforces the soul's healing resources, the only resources that can help the sufferer make it through. Oh, Shannon, we need to post that. Yeah, that's yes. it's a great quote, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's get that on our website. Okay. <laughs> but I, I think too, like all that you're saying, I think we would just like to add our witness, right? Both from, I think our own personal experiences and having worked with like hundreds, if not thousands of people now, um, that go through this is that we can, we can legitimately say as mental health and wellness professionals that there are people who are harmed and even abused by religious systems and religious communities. And there are people who are incredibly edified and find structure and community and the support that they need 
in their belief systems and religious communities. Those two things are happening, I believe, in almost any religious community <laughs> out there. And if we can't hold space for that, and I think the reason why it's harder to hold space for that, you know, maybe we can hold space for that in other arenas, but why it's hard to hold space for that in a religious arena is because it's difficult for most people to envision anything that has to do like with God or universality or things of that to not, if, to not be the truth, right? The truth. And so if, 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 if my truth is corroborated by the truth, <laughs> then it's, it's difficult to make space, right? For somebody else's truth or experience. And I think that goes both ways, whether it's the religious person saying, well, but how could anything to do with the gospel or with God or with the church be harmful? That, that does not compute because all those things are supposed to be healing. That's, that's a way that you can get kind of stuck. Or if you're the, the lever, it's like, well, you know, it's all false. It's, it's made up. It's not true. So how could anything that's a lie or a con or anything be helpful? You know, so we get in these very binary kind of polarized ways of dealing uh, with these things, which then, of course, in the end of the day, what the human experience cares about more, it's not so much about whether it's true or not, it's whether or not I feel understood, seen, respected, honored, right? I love that you mentioned that, Jenna, I mean, Natasha, because so often what we see in mixed faith relationships or mixed faith families is each person wants to be seen, heard, and respected, and yet it takes humility on both sides. So for an active believer to sit humbly and to sit openly to a witnessing a loved one's faith transition, doubts, questions, heartache, trauma, that's a huge ask. And asking someone who is experiencing a huge and painful, potentially painful faith shift to also support their believing loved one, right? There's this moment where we need to surrender and ask the question, what allows you to be spiritually well? How do I support you in your spiritual wellness? And if we're going to honor that our individual journey is valid and we find meaning outside an institution, you better believe we better show up and support someone else to our capacity. I mean, safety and discomfort are very different things. We talked about that today in our supervision. But if your partner finds health, wellness, stability in their spiritual practice, are you showing up with the same level of love and support that you're expecting in your own faith transition? And that's, that is a life process. That is a humbling process. And it's about also surrendering the ego, that it is not about what I want for you. It is how do I trust you that you know what you need? I love that. So really quick, because I know most of us have to get going. Um, what are some, when the rubber hits the road type of ideas, right? So I think intellectually, most of us could be like, yeah, maybe if something's helpful to me, that doesn't mean it's helpful to everybody. Well, that kind of makes intellectual sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or if something's helpful to me, maybe it's not helpful to everybody. Uh, what, what, can, what, uh, what suggestions would you have to actually catch ourselves or to be more self-aware or to practice, you know, things that we can say, scripts that we can have kind of in our pocket to help us when these moments come up. I think a good like mantra to go into relate uh, conversations with people is um, managing the fixer. I'm not the fixer. Like just keep reminding yourself over and over. You're listening, you're not here to fix. You can't fix them. You cannot fix, you know, telling myself over and over, <laughs> manage the fixer, you know. Sometimes I need to tell myself over and over things, but to me, that's really helpful. Just remembering that that's not what I'm there for. I'm there to listen and hold space, not to fix. Yeah, I would say um, be aware of your own discomfort. It's hard to sit with other people who are in pain. I mean, being sitting in empathy with someone is a very vulnerable move. And so just be conscious of the discomfort that you're in. And you don't have to fix that either. You know, you just take some deep breaths and recognize it and breathe through it and just be there with the other person because it's this kind of work isn't comfortable for anybody, but that's okay. There's, there's healing and growth that comes from the discomfort you're in. 
Another tactical, you know, concrete approach is getting curious. And so I'll try to figure out, Natasha, how to link. I created a values exercise for families and couples. And one of the ways is to get curious about what values are we living into right now. Our values can shift and change. And sometimes when we look at our loved ones in a perspective of like, oh, this allows you to be spiritually well because it's in aligned with your values. There's more buy-in, there's more compassion. And then when we, when we think about and get really clear about our top three values that we're living into right now, how do we show up with compassion in discomfort? How do we show up in, with, you know, kindness, indifference, right? So if we get really clear as couples and families and individuals about our values and get curious about how does going to church serve you? and have the humility to understand what benefits and health that person receives from attendance, there's a softening because no longer is it I'm right and you're wrong. It's like, oh, this is a part of your wellness. And like, how do we surrender into that? And so I'll try Natasha to figure out how to do that quick PDF on um, this link. That sounds great. Yeah. And if you need help with that, I can help you probably. So, and Mike, we appreciate you hanging out with us for lunch. <laughs> he continues to make comments. <laughs> so he talks about, yeah, develop self-compassion. That's really important. I agree. Having grace for ourselves is really important. Being able to repair if we feel like we made a mistake, I think is part of that self-compassion, right? To say, hey, I know that yesterday when you were trying to talk to me about this, it didn't go super well. I, I could tell my, I was defensive. I probably didn't, you know, I probably inserted my own ideas instead of just listening. Um, would you be willing to give me a second chance, right? Like repair attempts can go a long way. And my last thought is uh, validation goes a long way. So a lot of times when I'm feeling prickly and defensive and like, you know how you're listening, but you're like, oh, I can't wait till they stop or there's a pause because I want to get in there with my great idea. <laughs> So it's like, when I have that feeling, I am practicing all the time in my life. Like, can I just be quiet? Do I need to interrupt? Oh, that's such, you know, that's just feedback I've gotten from people in my life that, um, you know, are, are letting me know that that's something I need to work on. And so a lot of times, instead of going right in with my best idea, could I instead offer a validation statement first? Like, so if I'm hearing you right, this is what you're saying. Am I hearing you right? Um, it sounds to me like this is why this is important to you. Let me make sure I've made space for what you're trying to communicate to me before I just jump right into, you know, my brilliant ideas, which of course are so much better than yours, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I think that can be really helpful. Well, I hope that, um, this has been, you know, a, a little glimpse of some thoughts about some, a, a an idea that might be helpful if you or others that you love are in a different space religiously, um, especially if that's a new space. You know, it's it's one thing to uh, kind of go through life kind of with your people in a certain space, but then to have somebody shift, that can be really painful and hard and we don't know how to always address that. So any final thoughts from anybody before we go? Okay, this has been Symmetry Live. If you want to know more about us or how we can help you, go to symmetrysouls.com. We'll make sure and put that in the, in the thread. Also, if you have any ideas or thoughts that have been helpful to you, please share those with us. If you have a question that you want us to address on Fridays, please let us know either through a private message or right here again on the comments. Um, and then, um, what else was I going to say? Oh, and also if we, if we can't help you, we're more than happy to refer you to other places. So we're not obviously the only people that, that do this kind of work or the only resource out there. So, um, please feel free to ask us any questions. Everybody have a great weekend. Today is January 29th of 2021. So we're heading into February people. I don't know how that came to be, but we are. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.